Yes, indeed, amazing grace, and I am super excited about the new series we're starting. Um, but just before I get into the message, let me just say, it's just great to be together, man. Uh, my wife leaned over to me, which she often does just before I came up on stage, and she said, have fun, which is actually I need to hear, because when I get up to preach, I am so intense, like I am like just, and so just be, relax, have fun, enjoy this, like this is amazing that we get to do this. So let me just remind you. This is so cool, right? Here we are, uh, enjoying each other in the presence of God, receiving God's word, worshiping God together with a, with a God who loves us and has sent his son to redeem us. Like, wow, right? We're blessed. You're blessed. You believe that? Yeah. You're not quite as excited as I was kind of hoping you might be, but that's, you're good. Right on. Okay, so we're going to pray and get into God's word. Would you stand with me to pray? Lord, we do love you, and we are blessed beyond, way beyond what we realize, way beyond, and we know we deserve the very opposite of those blessings, and yet <laughs> you have abounded toward us in love, and so God, uh, wake up our hearts today to the wonder and the beauty and the majesty of your goodness, of your glory, of your grace. And I pray, God, that, uh, yeah, that as we gaze at your goodness together, that, uh, that it would grow our hearts, that it would enlarge our hearts so that we could run after the paths that you have for us. We ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So one of my favorite things to do uh, when I'm getting to know someone is to, as I'm talking to them, look for a topic that fires them up. Do you ever do this? Uh, you find somebody who's like super quiet, super reserved, never talks, and uh, uh, especially some, sometimes guys are like this, right? If you ever meet a guy who just like won't say a word to you, and then uh, uh, you, you'll start talking about, a lot of guys like that are, if you get talking to them about fishing, right? Fishing or hunting, and, and then suddenly this totally reserved, totally quiet, uh, totally uh, not saying anything person will just... Uh, come alive and start talking. Um, for other people, it's music. You get talking to them about music, they will come alive, they'll start talking. For some, it's food. For some, it's politics. Um, sometimes, some people, it's the environment, right? Oh, you know, on one side or another, right? People certainly uh, get fired up about that topic. Um, well, uh, Marianne and I were recently in Honduras. We just got back from that. And uh, we had a driver whose name was Mario. We called him Super Mario. I don't know if we have a picture of him here or not. Yeah, there he is, Mario, wonderful guy. And we were trying to get to know him. There was a bit of a language barrier, but he was just a lot of fun to get to know, and he's driving us here and there. And in, in Honduras, it's actually really important that you have a good driver and one that you trust, because uh, taxi companies, they tell us, make deals with gangs. Yikes, right? And uh, they can sometimes drop you off in the wrong places and so forth. But this guy was fantastic and just a lot of fun to get to know. And he actually really loved the Lord. And so uh, anyway, we, we would talk to him about all kinds of things, trying to get him, you know, going. And at one point he said, you know, everybody in Honduras loves soccer. Uh, which is true. Soccer is the thing there. They all talk about soccer all the time. He, 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 but, but we got talking about NASCAR, and he, all, you could just see something switch in his eyes. And he goes, I don't love soccer. I love NASCAR. <laughs> and then he says, because I'm a driver. <laughs> you know, we were like, oh, yeah, we've noticed. <laughs> you know, like, whoa, right? Uh, but I'll tell you, when we got talking about NASCAR, man, he came alive. Well, uh, one of the main characters in the Bible is a guy named the Apostle Paul, and for him, it's God's grace. Uh, when you got the Apostle Paul talking about God's grace, you get the full force of his passion. I mean full force. You get his crazy joy in it, his deep gratitude for it, his fierce anger towards anything that threatens it. For Paul, grace was everything, everything. Uh, look, look at Acts 
20, 24. It says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news or gospel, the gospel about the wonderful grace of God. Paul just goes, my whole life is worth nothing except for telling people about this grace, right? Telling people the good news, the gospel of the wonderful grace of God. So we're going to start a new series today on grace. Um, We've called it Grace, No Strings Attached, because uh, that's what the theme of this this book of the Bible we're going to look at together. We're going to look at the book of Galatians. Um, Galatians is, is Paul's by far the most passionate of his, in fact, Paul's known as passionate in all of his letters, the letters he writes, but this Galatians is like by a long ways, the most fired up, the most intense book that he writes. In fact, it's known as the most passionate of all the New Testament books. Um, and the book of Galatians is all about grace. And what, what it's really about is that Paul is concerned that there is false teaching. False teaching that is infiltrating the churches in this area called Galatia. And it is tempting them to leave grace behind. Uh, to, to, to add things to grace. When, and when you add something to grace, it, it's no longer grace. So uh, that has Paul very, very fired up. In fact, uh, most scholars believe that if Paul hadn't vehemently, vehemently defended grace in the book of Galatians and in Acts chapter 15, which is parallel to the book of Galatians, that Christianity today, as we know it, would not exist. That's, that's how important and serious uh, this book of the Bible is and how vehemently Paul defends uh, this, this doctrine of God's grace here. Um, there's actually another guy who's really fired up about grace is uh, a guy named Martin Luther. You may have heard of Martin Luther. He was a reformer in the 1500s. And before he was a reformer and really uh, changed the church as we know it today, uh, he was a Catholic priest. And as a Catholic priest, he taught at the University of Wittenberg. Um, and he taught various books of the Bible. When he taught the book of Galatians, He actually wrote a commentary on the book of Galatians. And as he studied that book and and, and grasped it, he started to realize, oh my goodness, everything I've believed about God, everything I've believed uh, about his word, everything the church has been teaching is wrong. And he realized that the church had veered from grace. And, And again, when you veer from grace, it's not a small issue. It means everything. Because if you add a little bit to grace, it's no longer grace. So I'll tell you, this got Martin Luther so fired up, realizing this, that he used Galatians. It became what they called the battle cry of the Reformation. Uh, This is one thing he, he said years later. He said, the epistle to Galatians is my epistle to which I have wedded myself. It is my Catherine. That was the name of his wife. He just loved this book of the Bible. Okay, so if Galatians is all about God's grace... And we, we have to make sure that, it, that we don't add anything to grace or twist God's grace. If it's that important, what is it? Well, one of my favorite definitions of grace comes from a guy named Jerry Bridges. He says, grace is God's free and unmerited favor to sinners who deserve only judgment. It is the love of God to the unlovely. It is God reaching down towards people who are in rebellion towards him. So th- there's a definition for you of grace. And, and if you'll lay hold of that, if you'll live into that, if you'll, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more. Okay, so that, that's, let's hold on to that definition. And uh, what Paul wants to argue here is that grace, that truth will set you free. Actually, uh, the word uh, freedom comes up over and over in Galatians. The word grace, of course, comes up over and over in Galatians. You know, the other word is the word bondage. So bondage and freedom by the grace of God, right? Those are the three key words in the book of Galatians. Bondage, grace, freedom. So when you hear bondage, bondage to what, Paul? Like what's the the lack of grace going to cause you to be in bondage to? Well, first of all, I would say this. It, it's, it's a bondage to guilt and condemnation or really living a life filled with shame, okay? So when we don't grasp the grace of God, we wrestle with shame and condemnation. And all of us struggle with this in varying degrees. Um, we, we ask questions like this. How could God possibly love me? Like me. If he really knew me, which he does, How could he 
Love, I am such a mess. I'm such a sinner. There's so much junk in me. There's things fundamentally wrong with me, which is true about all of us. It's true about the entire humanity, right? Uh, so we, we think of God as a holy God, and we realize, boy, in my mess, in my sin, in my junk, in, the, in what is fundamentally wrong with me, I can't relate to a God who hates sin. And we feel bad about that. We beat ourselves up for that. We feel not worthy. And whenever we try to relate to God, there's this conscience, this shame that just pulls us away. Where we think, man, I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve a relationship. I don't deserve to be around him. In fact, uh, and this is true whether you hang out in church uh, environments or whether you just hang out anywhere in the world. If, if you were to walk the streets of Moose Jaw, and trust me, because I do this, <laughs> or talk to people in the grocery stores or wherever you go, and just bring up the topic of God to people, you'll, you'll, you'll hear it within seconds. Something about their conscience, something about their, 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 uh, uh, I'll give you an example. I was at Safeway one time, uh, going through the, the till, and uh, I knew the guy who was the cashier, and I've been trying to, you know, share Jesus with him, invite him to church, that kind of thing. Uh, so I was having a nice visit with him, and as I got through, I realized the guy behind me was from our church. And so, you know, as I got through the till, I had my groceries, uh, but I didn't want to uh, leave because I wanted to greet the, the guy behind me. So I was like, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. And so we got talking back and forth and he turned to the guy at the till. So a guy in our church turns to the guy at the till and says, this is my pastor, right? Because he's trying to make a connection there and, and see, you know, just hopefully friendly moment, right? And you know what the guy, the guy at the till react just out of his mouth before he even thought about it. He was like, oh, I hope you've been good this week. This is my pastor. Oh, oh. What, what happens when we think of God, when we think of pastors, when we think of spiritual, suddenly all of us, we have this, oh, oh. I know, right? This is, this is what Adam and Eve felt that moment God came after they had sinned, right? They, they, they felt that shame. Okay, so, so bondage to shame and condemnation. There's a second kind of bondage, and it's a bondage to the burden and obligation of the law, Okay? Um, th this one is, is a little more uh, subtle, uh, but what happens is that the idea of living up to God's standards, the idea of doing what is right, doing what is good, um, when, when we don't really grasp grace, we live in a kind of bondage towards goodness or towards righteousness. We look at it and we long for it, but instead of it being a joyful pursuit to us, it actually becomes a kind of burdensome drudgery. We, we, we say, man, I have to try to be good. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. I know what God would want for me. I know I'm supposed to do these 10 commandments. Not murder, but boy, did that person really tick me off. <laughs> right? Okay, that's a little extreme. But you know what I'm saying, right? I, I'm supposed to not, 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 not. Don't murder. Don't lie. Don't lust. Don't think bad thoughts. Don't say bad things. Don't gossip. Don't. I just got to not, not, not. And oh, I'm trying. And God's standards, God's laws, uh, Living with a clean conscience becomes this, this sort of, I wish I could have fun. I wish I could do what I want. I wish life could be good, but we all got to be good people, right? And, and then the law or God's standards, goodness, uh, in, instead of being something desirable and joyful and, and uh, uh, just a wonderful thing, it becomes a, a burden and an obligation. Okay, so that would be called, those two things, bondage to shame and condemnation and bondage to the burden and obligation of the law, that would be called legalism, okay? We call that legalism. Now, what is the opposite of legalism? It's grace. And when you put those two things side by side, legalism and grace, the goal is not to be balanced, okay? It's not to be like, well, don't be too legalistic or too radically grace-oriented. It's to be somewhere in the middle. That is not the goal. Okay, legalism, bad. Grace, good. And so the goal is to be radically filled with grace. And this is what people are afraid of. They think, ooh, if we get too much grace, people just do whatever they want. They just have a license to sin. But that is actually when we don't take grace seriously enough. 
When you get grace as radical as it is, you start to see the radical depravity of our sinfulness and our wretchedness before a holy God. You start to see the amazing nature of Christ's payment of his own blood for your sins and my sins. And you begin to to actually hate sin and love righteousness. Radical grace. The more radical you get in grace, the more it teaches you to say no to sin and yes to God. It doesn't actually turn into a license to sin. If, if, If grace to you is a license to sin, you just don't take it radically enough yet. Okay, so that, that's that legalism, grace. So then what would it look like under grace? Well, I think under grace, it would look like this. F- the freedom of being loved and forgiven children of God. When we realize what God has done for us in Christ and we receive that for ourselves, we believe and experience the good news of the gospel, we experience God's undeserved love, right? That's what grace is, undeserved love, undeserved forgiveness, And we become his very own children. We get to have an intimate relationship with this holy God that we certainly don't deserve to have, but that he abundantly pours upon us. So there's freedom in that. And then there is the freedom of joyful, loving, and empowered obedience. We look at at God's laws, and, and instead of hating them for the burden that they are, ruining our lives, we love them. We long to live them. We read those Ten Commandments. We go, oh man, God, help me live so that there's no other gods before you. I want, I love it. I want to live it. Man, I long for it. And not only that, but I have the power to do it because the Holy Spirit is within me, enabling me. So that God's commandments are not burdensome to us. Okay, that's the, the freedom. So the the way we would describe this or the way we learn to live in this is we say we are abandoning our works and we're leaning into his cross, okay? That frees us from the bondage to shame and condemnation and it gives us the freedom of being loved and forgiven children of God. And we're abandoning our flesh is the way the Bible describes this. So our flesh is like our own attempts or our own works and we're leaning into his spirit. Okay? So our flesh is our own capacities, our own will, our own um, strength outside of God. And his spirit is his enabling power in us every day. Okay, so that is, is like a summary of the book of Galatians. And we all find ourselves somewhere along this spectrum um, at various times in our lives. And, and so when, when we give ourselves to Christ... Uh, we move from legalism into grace, right? When we believe in what Jesus has done on the cross and receive his spirit into our lives. But, but it's not like suddenly we go from, you know, one extreme to the other extreme. We move into this realm positionally and then we have to lean that direction. We're, we're, we're the, the gravitational force of this world, the message of this world, uh, certainly Satan is trying to... Uh, draws into lies, right? This is what the book of Galatians is about, that that Satan would want to twist the truth that we know and try to pull us back into that bondage. Um, So Paul just over and over in Galatians is saying, God set you free in Christ. He set you free from his grace. So don't go back into bondage. Instead, instead go deeper and deeper into the gospel. Don't leave grace, go deeper into it. And this is really, really important. Grace is not just the beginning point of the Christian life. Grace is the beginning, the middle, and the end. Grace is not the gospel. The gospel is not for unbelievers to become believers. The gospel is for unbelievers to become believers and believers to become stronger believers and stronger believers to become even stronger believers. And you will never stop going deeper into the gospel. I don't even think for all eternity we will ever stop going deeper into the gospel. The gospel is not the ABCs of the Christian life. The gospel is the A to Z of the Christian life. It's the whole thing. All right. We we did some lighting work this week, and it didn't quite get finished uh, before today. So if the lights change a little bit during the service, which they just did, uh, that is why. Okay. Okay. So the cross of Christ is the only way for a person to get right with God. The spirit of Christ is the only way for a person to obey God. Uh, that, that's the, the message 
of the gospel. And what we have to work at is never putting our works in place of the cross or letting anything diminish the all-sufficiency of, of Christ crucified um, and, or, or let our efforts get in place of the Holy Spirit. There's, there's an old preacher named P.T. Forsyth who summarized the book of Galatians like this. He said, the secret of the Lord is with those who have been broken by his cross and healed by his spirit. Okay, so that's my introduction to the book of Galatians. Now let's actually read it together. So we're just going to start in verse 1, and we'll let God's word speak to us. So it says, this letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority, but by Jesus Christ himself and by God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join it with me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. So, uh, Paul wrote a lot of letters in the New Testament. This one is by far the most forward and authoritative. Usually, he starts with a little bit of relationship building, introducing himself as a servant, these kind of things. Here, Paul just goes, I am an apostle. And I am not an apostle by my will or your will or anybody else's declaration, but God himself put me in this position and called me to speak these words. So these are not my words. These are the words of God. You better listen up, All right? So he's being very, very strong and forward, and, and that's the sense through this, this whole book. Uh, may God the Father, this is the next verse, may God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So the typical greeting, if you're writing a letter, or introducing yourself to somebody. You'd start with that piece about yourself, and then you'd say, peace to you, shalom, right? But Paul changed the typical greeting, and he added this grace and peace to you. And the reason he did that is because salvation offers us peace, okay? God, the gospel gives us peace with God, peace within ourselves, peace with others. That, that's what the gospel offers. But... The message we need to hear is that that peace is impossible without grace coming first, right? It's through the grace of God that we experience the peace of God. You'll never have peace with God until you experience the undeserved grace of God, right? The love of God. So it's in his free favor and kindness and love to the undeserving, uh, apart from our merit or our works, that we ever experience his peace. So next verse, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God the Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. So Paul, right out of the gates, introduces himself, uh, offers this greeting of grace and peace. Then he just goes straight to the gospel, straight to the event through which God obtained our peace through his grace. And uh, it, it, it's a wonderful statement of the gospel right here. The gospel is all about a person, right? His name is Jesus, and it centers on what he has done on the cross. He gave his life for our sins. Jesus gave his life for our sins. So that, that's the message of the gospel, that, that on the cross, Jesus took our place as a payment for our sins. We were lost. We were in rebellion. We were indebted. And why did Jesus do that? Why did he go and pay for our sins? I love what Paul says here, to rescue us. That really helps us grasp grace. Because what the Bible doesn't do is, is, is just say, okay, here's 53 steps to God, right? And if you just take these right steps, you'll find your way to God. That's what religion tends to do. Religion is, is like a ladder that tries to get to God. Do this and this and this and this. Take these steps, right? Uh, religion basically has, has three messages, right? God is good. You're bad. Try harder, right? Or be good, right? So, but the Bible doesn't have that message. The Bible's message, or maybe let me just pull back for a second and talk to you about that, that message. If, if the Bible was just a set of steps to get to God, then what it would result in is human pride. Because what we would de determine is how many steps we'd taken. And then we'd be like, look at me, God. You owe me, right? Look how far I've been. God, God, does this impress you? Does this impress you? Not only that, that's why religious people are the most judgmental people you know. Because in religion, we're all on a, on a hierarchy. We're all on a ladder somewhere. And we're all just trying to, who's higher than the other guy? 
right? And we're, so, so we're all sort of ashamed of how low we are or proud of how high we are. And we judge each other. And that's not just, by the way, um, spiritual religions, right? Even humanism, secularism is a religion of its own. It's just you'll get these benefits if you do this and this and this and this. And so we, we start creating ladders and then we determine who's higher or lower, right? And we create hierarchies out of that. So the gospel comes. And the gospel doesn't tell us how we can get to him. In fact, the gospel tells us you'll never get to God. You'll never be able to pay for your own sins. You owe billions of dollars and you have pennies. So the attempt of doing it yourself is not a good plan. Instead, God has come to us. Grace, right? And honestly, grace is not very flattering. Grace, grace tells us that we need rescuing, that we're drowning. Grace is humbling. So I love to think of grace. Grace tells us the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all in the same place. We're all sinners drowning in need of a Savior. Right? That's why sometimes if we're sharing the gospel or we're sharing with other people about our sins, sometimes that can be offensive to people, right? They'll be like, what? Are you calling me a sinner? And the answer is, well, yeah. But actually I'm calling all of us sinners, right? I'm putting myself on your level. I'm one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Like we are, we're, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all, the way uh, uh, John Newton put it, uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. We're all wretches, drowning, needing rescuing. All of us, same place. So it's humbling to come to grace. It's one of the reasons why it's hard to receive grace. Because uh, we, we have to admit our own incompetence. Here's how uh, Tim Keller describes this. This is the humbling truth at, that lies at the heart of Christianity. We love to be our own saviors. Our hearts love to manufacture glory for themselves. So we find messages of self-salvation extremely attractive. Whether they're religious, keep these rules and you earn eternal blessing. Or secular, grab a hold of these things and you'll experience blessing now. The gospel comes and turns them all upside down. It says you are in such a hopeless position that you need a rescue and it has nothing to do with you at all. And then it says God in Jesus provides the rescue for which the rescue which gives you far more than any false salvation uh, your heart may love to chase. Paul reminds, and this is about Galatians, Paul reminds us that in the gospel we are both brought lower and raised higher than we can possibly imagine. All right. So that, that's, those are the first few verses of the book of Galatians. And, and Paul just shares the gospel right there. And then the rest of Galatians teases that out. So we'll look at a few more verses together. Um, this, this, after he's done his introduction, here, here comes the content. Paul comes hitting hard. He says, I'm shocked that you are so soon turning away from God. He called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the gospel, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. You imagine getting a letter like that, right? Paul just goes, you're leaving God. How can he say you're leaving God? Well, when you leave the gospel, when you leave grace, you leave God. Because it's only by grace that we have a personal relationship with God. And that's what the gospel brings us into. The gospel doesn't just bring us into uh, a set of truths. The gospel brings us into a relationship with the God for whom you were made. It brings us before God as our loving father. And so if you leave grace, you leave the loving father. You leave that intimacy. You leave that relationship. It's, it's a really important thing. Theology leads to experience. Right theology leads to right experience. Wrong theology leads to wrong experience. The goal isn't the theology. The theology is the map. The goal is the experience right? Getting there. And so Paul just goes, if you leave grace, the, the right theology, the right truth, you'll, you, you're leaving the person, the God who's calling you to himself by his grace. Uh, later on in Galatians, he actually says, when you leave grace, you're severed from Christ. Okay, uh, then, then uh, just another beautiful statement he makes there. He says, he's called you to himself by the loving mercy of Christ. So the false teachers were saying, the cross is good. What Jesus did for you is good, but you just have to add things to it. In particular, they were saying circumcision. And Paul is going to let us know the moment you add a single thing to the all-sufficiency of the cross, it's no longer grace. 
Okay, so that's, that's shocking Paul. That's the worst possible thing. So then he says, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again that what we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news to you than the one we welcomed, let that person be cursed. So now Paul is just using, he's already been strong, but now he's using the strongest possible language he can, anathema, right? That's under a curse. Uh, when a person rejects the free and gracious gift of God, the forgiveness of sins, then th that is what happens. Uh, we are already, humanity is already under a curse because of our sin, right? And we move into, uh, under his forgiveness, under his blessing when we receive grace. Obviously, he says next, I am not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. So uh, after saying such strong and vehement things, he says, you know, this is pretty clear, everybody, right? I I'm, not, I'm not trying to say to you what you just want to hear. Um, and again, Paul, Paul's uh, all through Galatians, but in particular in the first couple chapters, he's saying, um, what I'm telling you isn't just my opinion against other people's opinion, right? Because he's got these false teachers who are coming saying their deal. So what he wants to say is, this isn't just my opinion, their opinion. You know, you guys decide which is which. He's saying, this is God's truth. This is God's word. This is not my gospel. It's God's gospel, right? And uh, so, okay, next verses. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received this message from no human source. No one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how violently I persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the tradition of my ancestors. So I, I love where Paul goes next. After he's given this vehement, pa passionate, like, guys, I'm all in on this. He says, how can I get this across to you? I'm going to share my own story, my own journey. My life, Paul says, is exhibit A of God's grace. And I love that. I love that because grace becomes real to us when we hear a testimony, doesn't it? When we hear somebody say with John Newton, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And we go, oh, there it is. There it, there's God's grace displayed. And what Paul is just saying is he's saying, man, in my pre-Jesus days, I was a terrible sinner. I hated the church. I killed Christians. But God reached even me. And at the same time as I hated the church and killed Christians, I was a religious zealot, Paul says, right? I was doing all the rules that Judaism was requiring, plus, plus, plus. And Jesus rescued me from that too, right? No one is so good that they don't need the grace of the gospel, and no one is so bad that they are beyond the reach of the gospel. That's what Paul's testimony lets us know. He continues his testimony, but before I was born, even before I was born, God chose me. He called me by his marvelous grace. It pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I could proclaim the good news, the gospel about Jesus to the Gentiles. Paul's just saying, this is nothing of me. This is all God. He found me. He chased me down. He opened my eyes, revealed Christ to me so that he could reveal Christ through me. This is marvelous grace. And the next number of verses, Paul just goes on to talk about his early life in Christ and, and what he did in his, his, his uh, early Christian life. And basically, he's letting them know, I wasn't any famous guy back then. I was just a guy who'd received grace and wanted others to hear about grace. He says, the, the, the people around the churches of that day, uh, they didn't really know me. But here's the one thing they did know. It says, people would say, and this is how uh, chapter one ends, the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Paul just goes, only God, only grace, could take a persecutor of Christians and turn them into a preacher of the gospel. Right? Only grace could turn someone who hates Jesus into somebody who just loves him with all his heart. He says, the gospel I'm sharing with you and I'm pleading with you to hold on to, is the one that changed my own life. I, I tried all my best ways, they got me nowhere. But when grace, 
When I got grace, or really when grace got me, it, it was like a 180. And it, it's not about me looking good, right? He says, they praised God because of me. Not they praised me because of God. They praised God because of me. He gets all the glory, which is, which is what grace does, right? Grace doesn't flatter us. It, it glorifies God. Now, there's, there's a whole bunch more to Galatians. That's just chapter one, but that's where we're going to stop today, okay? Um, and, and what I want you to just hear today is that, that, that God is saying in his word, through the Apostle Paul, the gospel is awesome. It's awesome. It, it brings you into a personal relationship with Jesus, not by anything you have done or could ever do, but by the cross. And so don't let anything or anyone or any lie that sneaks into your heart or mind twist or change or add anything to that. The cross is sufficient. The cross is sufficient. Don't let pride try to get into your heart and say, I, I could earn my way to God a little bit. I could get an inch or two towards him. Just, just, maybe this is the best way to summarize Galatians 1. Just let Jesus be the hero, Amen. right? He's the rescuer. He's the savior. Lean into that grace. And the more you lean into grace, the more radically you take the grace of God, the more free you become from shame and condemnation. And walk in that extravagant love, undeserved acceptance, full forgiveness. The more you find freedom from striving and straining in your own strength to do what God wants. And instead just walk in the power of the Spirit. It's, it's like if, if you were to think of God's law up here, legalism is, is an uphill battle to live God's law. Grace... Is God just plucking you from the bottom of that hill, landing you on top of it so you're no longer under the law, right? Under that burden. You're on top of it now. And now living for God is all downhill. It's just like, God, you're with me. You're in me. You're empowering me. It's your spirit. So here's, here's how I'd like us to Apply this, okay? If that's the truth, how do we apply it? I'd like us to hear Paul's conviction, his willingness to fight for the gospel, his desire to go into it, and his plea to, to the Galatian church to go deeper into it. And then I'd like us to just say, God, would you make that my conviction? Um, would you help me love your grace and love the cross? And, and help those things become precious to me. Help me become that person who, whose eyes light up like Mario's do about NASCAR, right? When we talk about grace. When we talk about the cross. We're, we're actually heading towards Easter. This is one of the reasons I wanted to do this series now. And, and my prayer is that the message of the cross would gain ground in our hearts. Actually, the end of the book of Galatians, it starts with Jesus paid for our sins. You know how it ends with? Paul just says, God forbid that I should glory in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's what I glory in. That's what I get excited about. That's what fires up my heart. Why don't we stand together? We'll close in prayer. Invite the worship team to come. And I want to just pray two things today. If you're here and you just say, you know, when I think of God's grace, there's been seasons of my life where it was more alive to me than it is today. I, I've lost my love, my, my passion, my fire for the grace of God. And I just want to get that back. I just, I just want to invite the Spirit of God to open my eyes. You know, I love the way Paul says it, when it pleased God to reveal his son to me. There is a work of the spirit of God to just shed abroad the love of God in our hearts, the way it says it in Romans 5. So if you just say, man, I, I feel dry in this and I want God to ignite this, reignite this in my heart. If that's you today, would you just lift up your hand and just say, yeah, yeah, Lord, do that for me. So Father, we pray for that. We pray for a igniting 
a reviving of the grace of God, the love of God. Lord, a, a, a realization of our own desperate need, a humbling of ourselves and an exalting of you, Jesus. Lord, we pray that our hearts would, would glory in letting you be the hero. Fire us up afresh for the gospel. And then just one more thing I want to pray for. If you're here and you just say, you know, I don't know that I've ever really understood the gospel. That I've ever really received grace in that sense, that it's undeserved, that I can't pay for it or earn my way to God. But that he just offers it to me as a free gift. You know, one of the things about a gift is it has to be received for it to be yours. And the Bible just says that very clearly. It says anyone who by faith puts their faith in Christ, in Christ's finished work on the cross, anyone who does that, God gives the free gift of eternal life to. He, he puts the free gift of a relationship with himself. He makes you a new person. The Bible actually says you become a new creation on the inside. And so if you're here today, and we, maybe we could just make this between us and God, uh, so just have our eyes closed, our heads bowed. If that's you and you just say, man, I want to receive the grace of God. I'm not sure I've ever received his grace. And I'm just turning my heart towards God today and just saying, Jesus, I receive your grace. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, yeah, I'm receiving that today. Right on, right on. Anybody else? Just say, I'm doing that today. Yeah, so good. So we're going to pray just a very simple prayer to today, a, a receiving grace prayer. We're all going to pray it together. Those of you who raised your hand or if you wish you did, those of you online, if you're saying, yeah, that's me today, pray this, mean it with your heart. Let's believe today is salvation day. All right, so let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I come to you now and I thank you for loving me. I don't deserve it. I'm a sinner, but you love me anyway. Thank you for going to the cross to pay for my sins. And right now, I ask you to forgive me. I receive your grace. Undeserved. Unearned. And yet now it's mine. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me your child. Thank you for giving your life for me. Now I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Why don't we give God a hand for doing that? Yeah, so cool.